Hello, I'm Christopher Tarantola, and today on Mars Talk, we are going to cover tardigrades on the moon and Mars, a new spaceport in New Mexico, NASA updates, and we're going to talk with the filmmaker behind the Mars Underground. But first, I want to make sure that you go to MarsTalk.org for all the latest episodes, social media, and links to everything in our episodes. Now, joining me today is Lucinda Offer. Welcome back. And uh, we got Scott J. Gill. Scott has been in filmmaking since he was a kid. He has worked in Hollywood on projects like The Abyss with James Cameron and with stars like Halle Berry, Naomi Watts, and Bruce Campbell, to name a few. Now, we will talk more about his back history with the Mars Underground specifically in a little bit. But for now, uh, Scott, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming on. No, oh, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, the first segment here, we're just going to go through a couple of the main news stories of the day and uh, talk about it. Uh, so first story is tardigrades on the moon and Mars. So the Beresheet landing attempt that happened a couple months ago uh, that we reported on earlier this year, they tried to land a probe on the moon, and unfortunately, one of the engines was turned off accidentally. And so it uh, was, by the time they got it turned back on, it was too much uh, Delta V needed. Uh, and so it crashed into the um, lunar surface. When it did so, um, it is now surmised by uh, scientists that tardigrades were on that craft, uh, which are microscopic little animals that kind of look like bears. Um, you can see them in uh, Star Trek Discovery, which is a whole nother controversy as well as in Marvel's Ant-Man among other popular culture. But um, they were likely pre present on the craft and they were probably able to survive the environment there on the moon because they're very hardy animals. Um, they're just so hard to kill, which feels like I need to have a sequel to Steven Seagal here, um, the movie Hard to Kill. Now, people are saying that they have, quote, contaminated or polluted the moon. Um, you know, Earth is no longer uh, the only planet with life in it that we know of, um, uh, the moon being the other planet. Um, you know, and some people have taken, uh, it's kind of become a little bit of a controversy, you know, vice.com to, to give you an idea of uh, how some people are looking at it. The tardigrade spill on the, moon, on the moon proves that we need rules for spreading life beyond Earth. So it's, it's, it's named as a spill like it was an oil spill or something like that. Uh, and in the sense that it wasn't necessarily purposeful, I guess. But um, Dr. Zubrin has, well, let's just put it this way. He might have tweeted about it once or twice. He may have gently disagreed with this point of view. Um, and, uh, you know. I'd like to comment a little bit about that. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So, I mean, there have been rules about life, um, you know, contaminating uh, I mean, some people see humans as a contaminant on our planet. You know, there's uh, so <laughs> um, and and the idea Dr. That Chris humans are a virus. <laughs> that's yeah. So Dr. Chris McKay, um, you know, he first introduced me. Well, I, I was familiar with tardigrades before, but he first introduced me to tardigrades uh, through Spaceward Bound. I think it was one of my first Spaceward Bound expeditions with NASA when I was there. And um, we went to the Mojave and we worked with other scientists. And there's this one guy from Canada who. If you wanted to order some tardigrades from him, you could. But what we did on this expedition was um, we would get pond water from that area of the Mojave, and then we'd bring it back to, we were at the research station called Zizix, which is um, uh, owned by Santa Cruz uh, University. It's really a popular place in the, in the Mojave for research scientists now to go and visit and um, do some work there. And uh, they've got uh, lots of facilities. They've got microscopes there. So we would put the pond water under the microscopes to see if we could find any tardigrades. And unfortunately, I didn't on that expedition. But it was just really cool to be introduced to that um, that idea and that aspect of this type of life that can live. So that was one of my first experiences, and I would say extremophiles, but Dr. McKay would say hardy life forms. He always wanted me to use that term instead, <laughs> hardy life forms, right? And there's something in, in uh, this organism's DNA that we can't find in any other organism that I know of yet. Um, I think this is all kind of new research, but something that allows them to dehydrate their cells. And, and I guess it's something that kind of switches on or off uh, this part of their DNA. And um, 
it dehydrates their cells and then it rehydrates when it figures out that the environment is fine for it to exist in. Um, and it's, it's a, absolutely, I mean, we want to be careful with what we're doing, but they're not, there's, we, I mean, who knows if, uh, how many meteorites might have life right. or tardigrades on them that are content, uh, constantly bombarding or, you know, impacting on objects around us. Um, sure, this is one that Israel is responsible for, or humanity is responsible for, um, but there's not much we can do about it now. We don't know if there have already been tardigrades on the moon. Right. Well, I mean, uh, Dr. Zuber, one of his main points is that you, you look at the moon landings uh, back in the Apollo era, it's not like they sterilized the inside of those landers and they didn't sterilize the humans themselves. So there's probably some other microbes on the moon long before Israel sent a bear sheet there. But wouldn't That's they all, right. You know, for the last, you know, wouldn't they four all be decades. Because they wouldn't actually be alive on the moon, right? I mean, there's unless they have an environment with water, aren't they going to be dead on the moon? I would well, imagine. <laughs> there, there's, you know, there are I mean, some traces of water on the moon. Right. Um, but, but, you're, but you're right. I mean, th there's no atmosphere on the moon. They would be, you know, easily exposed to radiation or, you know, there's no. They're in so, hibernation, I suppose. If somebody comes along and gives them water or something, then I'm sure they would come alive. But they're not actually so, living and, and existing on the moon alive right now, I imagine, just yeah. in hibernation. The, the, the point is, you know, they're not like, it's not like they're having a party and they, right. you know, they're starting to build a, a whole society. It's not like, <laughs> you know. If they are there, they're probably in hibernation. They're probably not moving right. around. And even if they right. were, even like, let's say they had the right conditions that they were able to, to figure out how to, to sustain themselves off the rocks on the moon or the regolith or whatever, and they had enough hydration or whatever they needed to, to survive and thrive. Yeah, but what's the big deal? Like it's the moon. Well, it's the moon like, is dead. Yeah, I mean. It's it's like, not like that's a bad thing that we brought right. life to another planet. It's right. not a bad thing. Not everyone will agree with you. Of course I, not. I know not everybody agrees with me, and that's my opinion, but <laughs> I strongly suggest that we as humans, that is part of our charge as life-bearing intelligence. You know, mm -hmm. that's what we are supposed to do is to bring life forth throughout the universe. Oh, if you're using you, my my favorite quote from Dr. Crystal Kay from Scott's movie. Because when I look around the universe, I think life is the most amazing thing we see. It is just incredible. And we human beings are uniquely positioned to help spread life from this little tiny planet, which it seems to have been started on, beyond. And that's our gift. Earth's gift to the universe, I think, is the gift of life. Oh, well, I, 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 I am... Certainly, well, uh, paraphrasing it, I, yeah. I don't know that it would be a you quote. You know what he said right after that quote? He Go ahead. said, and I always wondered if I should have left it in the movie. He said, he doesn't, he doesn't want us to think of us as these, you know, sort of arrogant bringers of life. He just sees us as sort of garden gnomes around <laughs> the universe, you know, helping spread life. We're gardeners. And it's not necessarily about humans going to other planets and bringing our life. It's about creating new life on other planets, plants, animals, that kind of stuff. So I always kind of wondered if I should have kept that quote in the movie, but. Mm -hmm. well, I, I know, cause I, I, I work at UCL at the University College of London. I've had to write a paper and I, I wrote it on panspermia and life in the universe. And I, I actually read a couple of Chris's papers on it. So I know he, it's, it's a subject that he really McKay, cares about. Not me, right? Yeah, yeah, Chris McKay. What did I say? <laughs> you say Chris. <laughs> uh, Dr. McKay, sorry, from NASA Ames, a planetary scientist. Um, uh, so he, he really cares about this and he, he does make it a point to just like as you said, Scott, um, uh, it, it, to also to be, to be respectful, but also that life is the most beautiful thing in the universe. I love that quote. That's the one right. that, um, that I'm talking about and that we should go forth and spread life, um, right. but do it with some, with some intelligence and, and consideration. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I'm not, I'm not opposed to, to being thoughtful about it. And certainly I, I don't want us to just do whatever we want, whenever we want, however we want, but let's. Let's put it this way, you know, um, if if you are against that, then why why would you support something like farming, where right. you know humans are changing the environment in order to grow food? Now, even if you're against like certain types of farming because it's it's harmful to the environment, you know, I live in Lubbock, Texas. We know what harmful farming can do creates the dull, created the dust bowl in the '30s, so we know what it's like around here. Yeah. But you know. People 
most people around the world can say farming is a good thing because it kind of feeds the entire populace of the world. If we didn't have farming, it'd be bad. Right. Bringing life elsewhere, it's it's very much in my head the same thing. It's it's the same argument because if we don't do that, you know, we're going to stagnate. If we're stuck on the one planet that we're on right now, the society and life itself will stagnate. And that's that's not even to start the argument about, you know, the backup, which is also a decent argument, not the primary one though. Right. An asteroid hit, if God forbid war happened, you know, uh, there's a super volcano under Yellowstone. There's all kinds right. of things that maybe not a, would extinguish life altogether, but it certainly wouldn't help. Yeah. Um, Probably take out. Wouldn't be bad to have, you know, some ways to continue civilization separate from the one planet. Right. But well, you, you, oh, sorry. Okay. You, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, uh, Chris, you brought up a good point, which is, you know, even though we send rovers or probes to other planets, they're not 100% clean. And, and that there's a certain percentage that, you know, you just can't, uh, you can't con decontaminate. I mean, something's being sent out there all the time. And then Scott brought up another good point. I mean, they probably aren't going to, you know, and we know that they're hardy life forms, but maybe they won't exist or they won't, you know, be able to rehydrate right. on the moon. Well, and... Um... Obviously, killing, like Robert says, killing something alive like the Earth is an evil thing to do, and we want to protect the Earth. It's really important. But if Mars and the Moon are dead and there's nothing alive on there, bringing life to it is maybe a moral good. Um, if, it's, if there's nothing there, there's nobody there, there's no conscious creatures there, um, maybe bringing life to those planets is a good thing. I, I would wholeheartedly agree. I mean, yeah, we. I. I could. I. I don't. I think I feel more uh, passionate about this than some other topics that we may talk about. <laughs> Not that I don't. I, I love everything we talk about, but um, I think we could talk about it at length. But I'm going to get us moving along because um, that was just the first story. <laughs> Virgin Galactic declares Spaceport America in New Mexico ready for Spaceship Two. Now. Uh, one of the things that we want to bring up about this is the idea that there have been a lot of people uh, in recent, uh, I'd say, months and years uh, talking about climate change, um, but they're taking it to a point where they're talking about how um, they're worried about the impact that, uh, like airplanes, like uh, even in politics, you've seen and debates, you know, people worried about, uh, oh, that guy took an airplane, but he's all this about climate change, so he can't listen to a word that guy says, and we're not getting too deep into that part of it, but you know, there's this idea that there is climate change, and why should we be sending um, things like Virgin Galactic uh, space planes across um, suborbital trajectories, let alone regular airplanes, let alone something like the SpaceX Starship and all this other stuff that's going on in the rocket industry nowadays? Um, that that impact is going to be too much and is not worth any benefit that they might provide. Um, and then kind of to dovetail with this is another story that I just kind of dovetailed into this one. Um, there's a company called HGH Sat out of Canada, uh, which plans to, um, they recently made an agreement with the Canadian government where they're going to um, start really monitoring air quality and uh, gas emissions uh, around the planet uh, with satellites. Um, and that's done in association with the Canadian government there. And so part of me is like, how could you be serious about trying to change uh, or stop climate change or do something productive regarding climate change and not be for space travel? Because how would you even be able to know about it if it wasn't for things like NASA and satellites and Earth observing uh, uh, programs like that, you know? Right. Yeah, didn't we even global warming started from sending probes to Venus, right? And <laughs> when we discovered Venus had a greenhouse, a runaway greenhouse effect, that's how we began to wonder if that could happen on Earth. If, I think that's the correct history. I, I don't know if that's the original origin, but it certainly was a great example of nothing else. Right. Um, well, the 1970s was when the whole environmental kind of like, uh, you know, group started. I, I know because I was born on the genesis of Earth Day. April 22nd, I'm going to oh, give wow. my money, 1970. 
So um, I'm going to be 50 next year. <laughs> so that's a big uh, five. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah, and there were lots of books. I mean, Robert talks about um, some books that were published back then. Uh, it was actually uh, Obama's science and technology guy during the Obama years. I can't remember his name right now, but he wrote a book about the population explosion. And, and he was, it was interesting that he was in charge of science and technology because he was so anti-technology. He was so anti-progress uh, because the more progress we have, the more pro you know, than um, industry we have, the, the more problems we're gonna have with carbon emissions or the more the population's gonna grow and Earth's not gonna be able to, to deal with that, to handle that. And, and his book touched on a bit back in the 70s, that he, the book that he wrote, touched on the idea of, of um, population control putting chemicals in the water, things like that, to chemically castrate, you know, individuals. So, I mean, he was, those are some of the ideas he was putting out there as possibilities. And so that's something uh, why we, in, in some ways, Mars Society for Humans to Mars, it's that we have a whole universe out there. We have our whole solar system to explore. Um, we don't have to think in this very narrow-minded way um, that well, we have no resources. scarcity mentality is what you're talking about. Say that again? It's, it's called scarcity mentality. Right. He, he talks about that and uh, that, and that uh, there are resources just right outside, uh, you know, our, our lower Earth orbit, you know, we have the moon, we have Mars, and we just have to kind of go and get them. Um, uh, but uh, well, Scott, I'm going to let you talk about this in a second, but I got something to say listening to what okay. you're talking about, Lucinda. So there's a TED Talk that I watched, and I will link it here. Um, there's a guy that talked about population and, and tracking the population. And this was, this guy is a data guy. He's not political. He's not trying to promote a, This is like, this is what the data shows. And he has, he's his, uh, what he does for a living is basically make data, uh, put it in forms that people can digest visually okay. and, and audibly. And basically pointed out how the idea that the population cannot be sustained by earth even just uh growing at whatever exponential rate is false because of the way the um population dynamics work with birth rates and stuff and if you just look at the numbers it's going to be fine you're probably going to plateau about 11 to 12 billion people and hmm. we will perfectly be able to feed and clothe and do everything we need to with all those people now whether or not politically we do all of that appropriately, that's a whole nother story, but we have that capability as a planet. The planet mm. can support us. Beyond that, it's the same point that you were just making, Lucinda, that you know, if we go to the moon, if we go to Mars, if we go out into the solar system and into the galaxy, there's so many resources out there that the idea that we have to limit ourselves, that we have to curtail I mean, talk about an evil plan to castrate people through water because we think, anyway, yeah. I mean, wow. Yeah. There's so much out there. There's no reason why we should even be talking about something like that, let alone considering doing it. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not supposed to be so, but that, that just bugs me that somebody would do that. Um, Scott, what do you think about all of it? <laughs> well, I agree. <clears throat> Castrating people through the water is an evil thing to do. Um, <laughs> At least we can agree on this. <laughs> yeah, no, that would be horrible. Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I kind of go back and forth on population. I, I see that um, obviously the earth is finite. I mean, you can't go on forever. Um, but, you know, technology keeps, we keep, people think we're going to run out of food and run out of oil and it keeps, we keep, I know the standard of living keeps going up around the world and GDP keeps going up. So uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I certainly think uh, government shouldn't tell people how many children they should have and stuff like that. Absolutely not. Um, uh, and I, the universe is, is pretty much infinite. So hopefully we can become a space for any civilization. I would like to protect the earth as much as possible, of course. Um, I'm not so concerned about planets where there's no life. I mean, that doesn't, that strikes me as a good if we bring life there, but protecting the earth is obviously the first priority um, to me anyways, so. Yeah, as someone who's born on Earth Day, I, I, I've always considered myself, you know, someone who definitely cares about the environment and, and you know, recycles and make sure I'm doing the right thing when it comes to being a human and living here on this planet and taking care of it. Um, but at the same thing, I think some of those ideas 
Uh, and I think that's, I won't, don't want to speak for Dr. Zubrin, but it sounds like that's kind of what he's getting at is, um, you know, that it, it sort of stops progress. And he's, I think his biggest concern is that space, human space exploration is like the ultimate goal out there for progress for humanity. And if we want to, you know, if, we're, if we want to say like, like, you're, like people would complain about uh, doing a Virgin Galactic flight at a time like this, when Greta Thunberg, you know, she's an amazing human being who's, who's, so, who's, who's speaking wonderfully about the environmental impact, you know, carbon emissions and all that on sure. our planet. And she's going and she's living, she's walking the walk, right? Yeah. She's on a sailboat across the Atlantic to get to a, a, a conference in Chile that she doesn't need to get to for nine more months. And she just want to make sure she has the smallest carbon footprint as she possibly can to get there. So, I mean, that's, that's fantastic. I don't know that we all can do that. Um, but, you know, we, she's just like the, a superhero, you yeah. know, for doing, for doing that. Um, and, and of course, you know, an inspiration for us to do more, to protect, to, to, to um, help our planet. Um, but I think that uh, the, the point of, of original, I know Virgin Galactic has taken a long time, but the original idea was to give people that experience to see the curvature of the earth, the overview effect, to inspire people about the importance of human space exploration, becoming a spacefaring society, that how can it not be worth it? Right. Um, and then the well, idea is, if they, sorry, uh, just last thing, the idea is to make it cheaper and, um, you know, the more tickets they sell, the cheaper it becomes, hopefully, and the more people who see it, the more people, they, the more people understand the importance of it. Right. Yeah. Well, I was, I was going to say, you know, think about this, too. You know, we're going to learn how to live on the moon, which, which has basically no atmosphere, which has no soil to speak of, which has you know, basically raw materials that humans have to use ingenuity to make work for us. Right. It's completely doable. It's very much in our ability to do so, but it's not something that you just show up and say, ah, okay, I've arrived and you sit back in a hammock, right? And the same thing with Mars. We're going to go to Mars. We're going to learn how to use the resources there to create a livable environment. How much will doing, actually doing that on such a harsh environment so to speak to to humans naturally figure out how to do that successfully and not just for humans but for all the life that we bring the plants and the animals and the the microorganisms and all of that to then be able to use that same type of technology and the things that we learn in doing that bring it back to earth as a technology and say okay this is how we can help reverse the negative effects of climate change this is how we can help feed these people in a more efficient manner so that we're not having to use as much farmland. This is how we can do all of, I mean, I can't even imagine all the things. You just look at the little bit that, ha, and I say a little bit, the little bit that has come out of NASA from going to the moon 50 years ago and going around the earth in, in circles since then. The amount of technology that has been brought and made everybody's life better on this planet, it's, it's, it's not even close to to laughable the idea that we shouldn't go because we got to focus on the problems here we have to go because we need to focus on the problems here not despite them again I'm agreed a, i'm being i'm being more forceful i like on a soapbox today i'm sorry guys I'm supposed to be neutral but i'm not <laughs> anybody else if scott wanted to say anything else that i was um term. No, I don't have any more to add to that um, that, okay. that I can think of. Um, All right. So we'll move on to the Marshall Space Flight Center, um, which has been selected as NASA's Human Lunar Lander Program. Uh, Texas ain't happy about that, y'all, by the way, uh, especially our senators. Um, NASA still has uh, no head of human space flight after Gersten Meyer's exit or, um, I mean, reassignment. Um, and... Right now, the interim leader is Ken Bowersox. Uh, another, uh, th these are just, just a bunch of bullet points on what's going on with NASA. SLS is slated to launch in 2021 rather than 2020, according to its contractors. Uh, NASA has also called for RFPs for $7 billion worth of uh, contracts in cargo transportation uh, to, be, to, to get to the Lunar Gateway, to supply the Lunar Gateway. Remind me what an RFP is. Uh, re uh, request for proposal. So it's basically, I'm um, saying, okay, we need to get con 
cargo to the Lunar Gateway, we request, um, that we want uh, contractors to give us ideas about how they plan on doing that. And that's a very common way to, uh, even in just architecture, or however, that's how contracts are uh, initiated typically. Um, it's basically NASA saying, hey, we're looking for contractors to do this, this thing. Uh, and then uh, another uh, point here, uh, Boeing and SpaceX are both slated to start uh, uh, to have critical tests doing, to do critical tests in their crewed spaceflight programs this fall so that next year uh, they can both uh, actually start doing crewed missions to the space station, uh, which would be a good thing. So some of that is good. Some of it is, uh, we're just going down the same road. I, I, I got a NASA shirt on, so it's not like I, I hate NASA. I, I love NASA, but man, is it frustrating sometimes to see what's going on uh, within the company. The company. The it's not the NASA it used to be. There's yeah, so yeah. many more programs to feed and who are vying for money. Um, you know, and some of the programs we think are going to take us to space and humans to space aren't sort of well thought out or and become huge money pits. And I think that's what we're afraid of, especially with SLS. Um, so. I, I mean, I, I think the, the sale, the ship has sailed on, on that one as far as uh, it's already a money pit in that sense, but. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah, I don't know what to do. I, sometimes I daydream. I wish that some other, some new skunk works would be, would come about, you know, some sort of, I mean, even Mars Society has grown with some of our some of the people who begin in the Mars Society, you know, move out and create a new a new organization. You know, and that's how we've grown more Mars organiz more Mars and getting the word out more. It's actually well, I think they're out there though. I mean, uh, I actually one thing I, I failed to to talk about, uh, you got the Mars Exploration Program Analysis Group, right? So a bunch of scientists get together and talk about uh, the missions that uh, we got going on to Na uh, to Mars through NASA. They raised concern, and this was just last month, that um, NASA's Mars missions seem to be lacking after Mars 2020. We have Mars 2020, and then they're planning on doing a sample return in conjunction with ESA. And then there's one uh, like uh, CubeSat that's going to be sent out there to do some some not some cool science for the CubeSat, but nothing along the lines of, you know, Insight. March 2020, Curiosity, or any of those kinds of flagship missions, nothing that's really going to get the ball moving forward. And it's at a time when, you know, if we were actually serious about going to Mars with humans, we would need to be doing more, not less. Um, and so they were raising that concern that, hey, you know, we're not going to have the data we need in order to do the things that we're saying we want to do on Mars. <laughs> I love the collaboration. I mean, that's how we figured out there's water on Mars. And we even, you know, NASA has worked with ESA. They had two different um, orbiters, two different, uh, you know, uh, uh, orbiters in, in uh, going around the, um, in the atmosphere of Mars. Sorry, I can't think of the word right now. But, um, but it was NASA who picked up on a methane or methane, uh, you know, gas in the atmosphere. And then uh, ESA sent their orbiter over to do a, a same measurement, you know, and that's just science. How we do it on Earth, doing it on another planet, you know, more than more than one experiment happening, and and then you know if if the, if the same experiment is giving the same results, you know, then that's just more power to it actually being what we think it is, you know. So, um, uh, just so it's it's fantastic the collaboration. Absolutely. And so, I think we need, we need more of that. <laughs> so that's great. The, the problem you... I have with it, and sorry to interrupt again is that the president, every single president and every single administration seems to have their finger on NASA. And that's really uh, been the biggest problem to our human space program, exploration program. So when you um, say they, they've had their finger on NASA, what, what do you mean by that? Unpack that statement for- Every time a brand new president comes in, they want to create a brand new space program and they get rid of the old and they put their own stamp on it. And then, oh, let's see, can I do this within the eight years? I may be president or, you know, <laughs> so, no, it never happens. Um, and it's infuriating. And um, I don't want to get too deep into politics, especially with the current president. But, uh, <laughs> you know, that's just- well, uh, it, it's, it's not about Trump, right? I mean, you right. have Trump and he's got his program, but Obama had a program. Bush, Bush Jr. had a program. Bush Sr. had a program. Uh, I don't know, did Clinton have one? I think yes, he had the um, is well, no, I, I don't know if he took he carried on COTS or, or the Moon, Mars, and Beyond initiative. 
I didn't remember. So I think that came with yeah, Bush. And I think even didn't Reagan he was doing something more along the way Reagan, of Star Wars or something. International space thing. <clears throat> So you know, it's not it's not like it's a it's not a left or right issue, right. you know. I think NASA has always been bipartisan in that sense, and I think it it still is more or less, um, you know. Because believe me, I've talked to people who hate Trump, and they're still for a good program right. in NASA. And I've met what? people who think he's the best thing since toilet paper, and they're still for a good program with NASA. So this is not a left or right thing. This is not the typical politics. I think everybody that that sees what's going on with SpaceX, that sees what's going on with Blue Origin, that sees what's going on even with NASA, and they, they watch the YouTube videos like what we got going on with Everyday Astronaut and Scott Manley, we get excited. You know, there's a kid that's at the elementary school that my son goes to. He's seven. He's, he might have turned eight since I last talked to him. He told me in no uncertain terms, my father was in the Air Force. I'm going to be an Air Force pilot, and I'm going to be on Mars. He said the first person on Mars. I don't know if he'll make the wow. first, but he's going to Mars. Wonderful. There's no doubt in that kid's mind, and there shouldn't be. Right. Wow. You know, there's Can I so ask, much. Where do, we stand? where do we stand right now? I'm a little bit out of the loop. Where do we stand with Trump? And, like, what's the date for moon landing now? Who knows? Yeah. Terrible question. Nobody knows, I'm sure. I, actually, I, I, I got a lot of good info for you, okay? So no, wait, wait, I'm just kind of curious. I know he wants funny. to go to the moon, right? You're going to think this is funny. But he wants. Because okay. cause the current program is to go to the moon, right? Um, right. But guess who wants to go to Mars? You've got to know this, right? Who wants to go to Mars? Uh, who? Trump. Trump. Oh yes, I have heard this. Yeah, yeah, I know he's been. Why are we? He's like, why are we going back to the moon? We've been then. We've been there. We've right, done that. We need Mars. to go to Mars. Well, I know the Mars Society agrees with that, <laughs> but um, but I, it seems like we're going to go to the moon first, which is probably a good idea. I mean, it's right there. It's three days away. But um, is there a date set now for the moon? I know we still don't have landers that have. They still have to be built. So yes and no. So they have a whole that, and I've showed this on on the show probably episode five or six, I don't remember exactly, um, where they have a little um, chart and they have it planned out to 2028. So they want to land uh, footprints on, the, on the, the ground in the South Pole of the moon in 2024. And they want to set up the first uh, semi-permanent uh, base. So it's not that it would be permanently, uh, that there would be humans on it at all times like they would have with the space station right now, but that... Um, it would be sustainable to where humans could go back to it like they can with the space station. Um, and they want that to be in place by 2028. Um, they're depending on the SLS um, rocket, right. not only the stage that's currently being built, but there has to be uh, the one, I think it's called the 1A or something like that. Uh, so the upper stage needs to also be built in order for that to work. Um, they have truncated down the, the lunar gateway significantly you know, uh, we at the Mars Society have always been advocates of just eliminating it because even if you have just like a little pod there and it's in space and you have to go meet up with it, it creates problems with Delta V. But, um, you know, they still have the Lunar Gateway, but it's just going to be a propulsion module, a really basic habitation module, and I think um, you'll have cargo modules come up and provide cargo to it. And the cargo modules will all be done probably with things like uh, SpaceX and uh, Blue Origin and other contractors. I bet you ULA will try and get in on that as well. Um, then you also have the Orion spacecraft with the European service module. And the whole reason you need the gateway, the whole, re like, there's justifications all over the place that you'll hear uh -oh. come out of Bridenstine's mouth. What are, the, but, what are the reasons? I'm not clear on that. For that so I, I, I'll go into those in a second. <laughs> but um you know the orion capsule is heavy it's heavier than it, it and it has a, a a a smaller thrust to weight ratio than the apollo um modules had and so it can actually get to lunar orbit but it can't bring enough fuel with it to get back to earth once it's made it to orbit and it can only go to orbit it can't land it's a it's not a landing craft so they need the Lunar Gateway in orbit around the moon in order to have Orion work. Now, if they scrapped Orion or 
and like uh, I think like the Zubrin. I, I, I know it, she's laughing because it's, it's laughable on the one hand, but actually it's kind of the, the way you need to go if you're just thinking about it from a practical, uh, just okay. a practical point of view. Dr. Zubrin, I believe, is the one who suggested that we just use a dragon capsule. I know there, there are people out there that are doing it to uh, like the dragon two that they're developing to go to the space station. You just send that same craft out to the orbit of the moon and you have it docked with a, uh, a lander, you sit and, and just like Apollo, you send them on down. And um, once you actually have landers on the moon, you have a base on the moon. You don't put the base in orbit. You put the base on the moon. You can create the fuel there. Right. And so that fuel in conjunction with a, um, a dragon capsule, you'll be able to actually fuel up a dragon capsule, do a hop from that location on the moon to any other part of the moon that you want, or back to right. uh, low Earth orbit or anywhere else that you might want to go because it's a lot easier to, to hop off the moon than it is to get off of Earth. And since you're making the fuel there on the moon, um, it's, it's a significantly cheaper because you don't need so much. You know, the rocket like equation is a lot nicer to you on the moon. That's one of the reasons why I think the current space program or human space exploration program, I mean, all the money is going into maintaining the International Space Station, making, you know, that thing's constantly having to be maintained. It's, uh, um, you know, it's an expensive mission. So creating another space station around another object in our solar system, how is that going to help? And Robert doesn't call it the Lunar Gateway. What does he call it? The, the, the lunar toll booth. Toll lunar toll booth. <laughs> Because it, it's it's there just to suck just, money out of the system. And or, I think one of his biggest problems, and not just his, by the way, you know, I, yeah. I'm pretty much with him on, I'm not on everything that ever came out of that guy's mouth, but certainly on this stuff. Um, you know, it's sucking the money that could be used to do so many other things. We could pay for a lunar base. We could pay for a mission to Mars sustained. Uh, not just one mission, but missions to Mars, crewed missions to Mars, with the money that they're using just to build the gateway, right? Huh. And that reality was a, is painfully apparent because Trump is kind of, whether he's doing it for the right or wrong reasons, and again, we're not trying to get too deep into those types of politics, but um, he is basically telling them, I want us to get to Mars, I want us to get to Mars, I want us to get to Mars. I mean, you had uh, Michael Collins sitting there on the 50th anniversary in the Oval Office, and he's asking him, you know, what are you thinking? Michael Collins says two words, Mars Direct. Really? That's all oh he my said. Gosh. I didn't realize And that. so then Trump goes to Jim Bridenstine and says, well, what about that? I think you should consider the other side of things, you know? And the Bridenstine just has, you know, his, his talking points, and he just basically said the same talking points. And this is not a criticism of him, because he's a... I think, again, doing a great job with what he has, but he's in a, between a rock and a hard place. He's got senators that he has to work with to fund his organization. He can't just go off and say, yeah, we need right. to get rid of this thing. But he has also made moves as much as I think humanly possible within the political system that, and the power that he has to make that as feasible as possible. He has truncated the gateway. He has... Um, increase the amount of commercial um, integration into the moon program he, that they have been doing. He's done, I think, everything that he could. Um, and I think Gerstermeyer going out, um, which happened, uh, what, like a month ago, um, that is all part of it. You know, Gerstermeyer, as great a guy as that is, and I have a lot of respect for him, um, he's probably still coming from it from the old mold. And you, you know, in your documentary, The Mars Underground, which we'll talk about a lot more later, you know, you, you have a guy from NASA coming in there and it's like, well, you know, this can't be done. It's great to fantasize, but uh, it's, it's another thing when you have to put it together, when the nuts have to fit the bolts. We are not ready to send humans to Mars right now. We've got to know a lot more about radiation and radiation mitigation. It's a long trip. It's a six-month trip there, a six-month trip back. It's probably a year on the surface. That's a lot of radiation. And I think Gerstenmeier is part of that old thinking that, you know, it, if for us to be able to do this and do this right, we have to do this. 
and this and this and this and we've got to make sure that those guys are happy and 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 if you're trying to make sure that all these contractors are getting paid and all these senators are getting the right constituents happy and all that's going on Nothing's you're not going to make it happen yeah. all right what do you think guys i i feel like i've talked way uh, so it's no, I, no, I, yeah no i well i appreciate <laughs> well the, it's not depressing to me and here's why <laughs> they're coming kicking and streaming but they're coming along spacex blue origin virgin galactic yes. they're dragging them in okay. they're not gonna let them stay thank goodness for spacex and dragon and all that <laughs> <That's> stuff right. <laughs> agreed so yeah, yeah. It, it'll come along it, it might not happen I, I don't i actually i believe that uh spacex or blue origin will be one of the or a, a private organization if not one of those two certainly a private company will be the first crewed i say first the next crewed mission to the moon will probably happen by something built by I, a private mission i wish i had some of you know your optimism i i mean i feel like yeah maybe it's you know, I've, I've been in the game for so long since, you know, executive director for a decade now and I've uh, been with the Mars Study since 2002. I don't know. I think I've been, I've lobbied through three presidencies and I'm just like, I'm exhausted and I'm tired of hearing the same old thing. And I know there's a lot of people out there who are just tired of this and want something to happen already. I would love us to just go back to the moon, but just kind of yeah. get rid of all those extra stuff that we don't need and just do, I'd be happy to do it back kind of a Apollo 2.0, you know? Right. <laughs> right. So See, I, 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 would, I would be very upset if we just did Apollo 2.0, because if we just did another boot no, saying footprints and flags. I'm not saying, of course not. No, yeah, exactly. We, yeah, no, that would be disappointing. But just to get men, just to get humans on the moon once again, to re-inspire the generation, like, you know, I think what you're saying, those people who did the Apollo, they're, they're all gone. You know, they're not in industry anymore. Uh, all that technology and information and intelligence, gone. A lot of it's, it's forgotten, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's heartbreaking to me. It's depressing to me, and I'm angry about it, you know? Um, well, uh, understandably so, but here's where my optimism comes from. You know, in 2005, I don't, I don't think, certainly not in 2000, not in 1995, not in 1990, not in the 80s, not in the 70s. There was no companies like SpaceX. You had ULA, you had Boeing, you had Lockheed Martin, and they were there to make money. And don't get me wrong, SpaceX is trying to make their money, and they're making their money. But they are coming at it from a different point of view, and they're being disruptive to the industry. And forgive me, I, I forget the guy's, the gentleman's name. He came on the show two or three episodes ago, he was the guy who, um, I know who you're talking about. What's his name? Gary. Yeah. Is it Gary? <laughs> he was the guy at one of our conferences who we asked to get in a debate with Dr. Zubrin. And I think he willingly did. No, 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 no. Oh. Um, so he, it was just me and him. I I'm sorry, guys. I know this guy's name and I'm, I'm blanking on it uh, here on live, like he, <laughs> but uh, anyway, he, he was talking about how the steam, the steam engine industry, like the steamboats, they would, um, there was a couple company, they, the guy who invented the steamboat did the same thing that Lockheed Martin Boeing and, and the, the uh, Northrop Grumman do where they, they just basically, they make things as expensive as possible and take as long as possible so they can just get money from mm -hmm. The, the government. And then along came another company uh, that that made it as cheap as possible, made it work better. And they tried to pass legislation to stop them from being able to do it. That all didn't happen. And eventually, everybody got on board with the cheaper and faster way. And so history tells me that what SpaceX is doing very specifically with the reusability and I always include Blue Origin and others in there, but SpaceX is leading the charge. They're the point of the spear for sure. What they are doing is changing the game in a way that it, we, we've never had that optimism before. It, there's never been a game changer in the mix making things happen. You know, 10 years ago, the idea that you can make a rocket be reusable the way an airplane is was laughable. 
Now, every space agency that is anywhere close to serious, even, even small ones are talking about, that's the only way to go. He said the same thing with electric cars. Electric cars, a decade ago, it was laughable to say that you were yeah. going to make a left. If you made an electric car, you did it to get some benefits from the government to, out of a loophole, and you made 15 of them, and you sold them to the 15 people that like the smell of their own farts, and you were done, right? <laughs> now, you got Tesla, and it's not just Tesla. Every single car company out there, they're, if they're not going full electric, they're certainly having a significant majority of their lineup be electric. Even the Ford Motor Company, like the original, right? Ford Motor Company just announced that they're coming out with SUVs and F-150 pickup trucks that are going to be all electric because they, they invested with Rivian and all this stuff. And I'm getting off the topic here, but... No, my, no you're not. My, my disruptive. My husband wants a new Porsche because they're going electric and they're coming oh. up with the interface that's very much like Tesla. So you're right. But a lot of the, you know, very well-known car companies are, are competing even with a lot of that technology that's coming out due to Elon Musk. Right. So, you know, there's been a hundred years of, yeah, we're not going to have an electric car and now it's going to be the way it is. And we've had a you know, 50 years of, yeah, we, we can't go to the moon sustainably. Yeah. We can't go to Mars. Yeah. We can't, we can't, we can't. And Elon Musk is like, yeah, uh, watch me, hold my beer. Right. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, well, does he have specific plans for the moon that are with a date uh, uh, in the future? NASA SpaceX? Oh, or no, SpaceX. SpaceX. So, yes and no. So, with date <laughs> on Musk, they don't always jive well. He's always giving you the soonest that they could possibly make it happen, essentially. And they never make those dates, right? No. Yeah. So, he's talking about um, the the Starship um, would probably launch uh, sometime in the next year, uh, mm -hmm. test, test flights, not crude or right, anything right, like right. that. Um, in the next year, we're gonna have test flights. Actually, any time now, people are waiting. Any minute now, he's gonna be doing the first test flight of the prototypes uh, out of Boca Chica, and then mm -hmm. they're building a couple more prototypes there in Florida. Um, and they've already put plans together. We uh, talked about it last episode where they're putting plans together to change um, uh, launch pad 39A, launch complex 39A in Florida, you know, where the Apollo yeah. missions happen and uh, so many historic missions with the space shuttle as well. Um, they're going to rearrange certain things on it to uh, accommodate the Starship. So they are, they're really all in on this Starship um, concept. Right, but and, don't we still need like a lander to get to land on the moon? So not with Starship, right? Starship could land on the moon. It's kind oh, it of designed to be oh, okay. possibly landed, I don't think right? I've seen that. Okay. Um, now I don't know if that's how they'll end up doing it, but they're talking about like doing a mission, at least going in orbit of the moon uh, with the Starship in 2022, and landing on by 2024 themselves. Uh, the quote that sticks in my head, and this is from memory, guys, so it's probably more of a paraphrase than a, a direct quote, but Elon Musk says, I think the best way to show NASA that we can land on the moon is to land on the moon. It's easier to land on the moon than to convince NASA that we can do it. <laughs> oh, there you go. Wow, that's a great quote. And then you got Blue Origin. They came out with Blue Moon uh, like three months, two, three months ago. And so they actually, they are developing a proper lander that makes, that looks much more like what you would think of uh, as a moon lander that can carry uh, any kind of miscellaneous cargo, or you could put a, a um, habitat pod on top. You could go to Bigelow. Bigelow has um, created this uh, concept for a, um, like a, you got four hotel rooms, if you will, that are Bigelow right, inflated. Right modules and then they're connected by a central thing so it kind of looks like an h uh, roughly and um you could stick one of those on top of the blue moon uh, amazon's blue moon say amazon blue origin and land it onto the moon offload it set it up and you got your base right there so this technology is being actively researched and developed by private companies and that's why i have so much optimism about it well, if I was depending on NASA and NASA alone, yeah, I would be pretty pessimistic. That's fine. Then leave the landing on the moon to the private companies and let yeah. NASA then focus on the bigger picture of Mars. That's what I would love. Mm. Um, so I don't know. I, well, and NASA, that's kind of NASA what they're doing, actually. They, they're they asking for the 
contractors to to come like they're right. saying we want to land on the moon we want to do it at the south pole give us your best shot on how to do that and if it works we'll make it happen that's what they're doing and what is the architecture we're working on for the return to earth from the moon is it still the I, yeah, so um, basically, you, you're still going to have the lunar gateway, the, the oh, NASA's okay. plan, okay? So you got the, you got the gateway. Um, you send the Orion capsule, the humans in the Orion capsule to it that's already been supplied by mm -hmm. organizations, including the, the station right. itself. Um, the, they, you dock with the station. You fuel up the Orion while you have the guys transfer to a lander. Then the lander goes down to the surface of the moon. They do their mission. They come back up to the gateway when they're done. They transfer back okay. into Orion, which is now refueled, and then Orion gets back um, to Earth. That's Got the it. mission right now. Okay. Not the most efficient, but you know what? It's so much more doable than what it was a year ago. Right. It, it like, you know, some people they're like, "This is where we need to be," and it's not right there. But we were here, and now we're here. Right. 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 So we're getting closer. I think that that will happen. The ironic thing is, is I think by the time it happens, we'll have somebody else be able to do it for a lot less money and privately. Well, yeah. I was just going to mention, you, you know, yeah. you talk about how Elon Musk is inspiring other people. You know, I mean, I think last week, China company, we're going to talk about it later, but Link Space. Yeah. You know, yeah. This got a lot of press on launching a rocket. It didn't go up very high. So I think, I'm not sure how many feet. It was in the thousands. The Mars Society <laughs> emblem on the side of it, too. That's right. Oh, it did. Right. Yeah, you can talk about that a little bit later. But that was Link Space. And I just got back from China. I got to meet you know, one of the wow. uh, founders of that uh, rocket company. So pretty good. All right. Well, we're already uh, okay. an hour into this. Uh -oh. So, uh, and this is mostly my fault because I've just been going off of my, my soapboxes here. You're such um, a fountain of knowledge, Christopher. Well, uh, you know, doing this show, if nothing else, it keeps me in the loop. Giving you an education. That's right. Um, education, yeah. <laughs> so it, we're going to go on to organization news. We're going to do chapter news. We're going to close out this part, and then we're going to go ahead and uh, start on uh, part two, which we'll release a week from now. And I so, suggest we speed through it. Yeah. So this okay. is going to be lightning round. If y'all have a comment that uh, y'all want to say, that's fine, but we're not going to go as in depth as we have been with this other okay. stuff. So we really only have one main piece of information here, and that is the 22nd annual Mars Society Convention is coming. It's October 17th through 20th at the University of Southern California's Fertitta Hall in Los Angeles. The theme is the space revolution opening the way to Mars, which is basically, I just gave you the outline of, of what that is. Abstracts can be submitted, link in the post, um, before Tuesday, September 17th. It should be less than 300 words, um, the abstract itself. Now, your presentation could be obviously longer than that. We just need you to, to explain, and they got a lot more details uh, uh, in that link, so go to that link. Um, now, we have had some abstracts and some uh, people booked for the show now, and we started making those announcements on our website, marsociety.org. Uh, so we got Tom Hoffman from JPL. He's the project manager for Mars Insight, which pff, talk about cool, man. I don't know cooler than that. Um, and so he'll be giving a presentation at the conference. We're also going to have Dr. Darlene Lim uh, out of NASA Ames, uh, and she's going to be talking about uh, human design elements for missions to Mars. Um, and then we got Dr. Chris Zachney. I, I hope I said that right, Zachney. Um, of Honeybee Robotics on robotic drilling on Mars. Um, and the list is growing, so uh, I'm really excited about it. I'm, I'm crossing my fingers working on maybe being able to go to this conference. <gasps> it will be my first conference, but really? no promises yet. And I will if I be go, there... you, you'll, you'll be sure that Mars Talk comes with me, okay? Oh, that would be cool. And you know, I will be there introducing everybody and emceeing most Wonderful. of the I'll get to meet you in person. Woods. It'll be nice. So are you going to be able to come? I'm in Southern know. California, so it's pretty close. I know. USC. <laughs> I'll try to come. That'd be USC, great. Right. I, I'll pick you up on the way there from Texas. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Pull up. <laughs> All right. Chapter news. Uh, members of Mars Society China recently attended the test launch of the Link Space Reusable RLV T5 rocket in the desert of Western uh, King. 
Hi, Province. Um, I'm in, I uh, yeah, I actually I'm have, sure I, I, actually I, I, I always here. butcher the names on here, guys. China if you here. are watching this because I, I say names correctly, you're watching the wrong program. Hi, I'm, I'm going to say, I think that's wrong. Um, in any case, uh, Linkspace added Mars Society on the rocket that successfully lifted off a few days ago and then relanded. A uh, senior Linkspace official said that the organization's name was included because many of the company's representatives were inspired to get involved in astronomical engineering by Dr. Robert Zubrin's book, The Case for Mars, uh, as Just shown right sure. over here. Just now, right. the Mars Society is also pleased to announce the creation of two new regional chapters, Mars Society Latin America and Mars Society South Asia. So Mars Society Latin America includes Mars Society chapters from Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Peru, and Uruguay. Several of these chapters have been involved in uh, with Mars analogs along the lines of the Mars Desert Research Station, uh, including sending teams to MDRS for several years. Our Latin American chapters are also active in astronomical research, education, and space advocacy, and they're doing a great job down there. Really impressed. And they're really going to be well placed because they are kind of near the equator, which orbit mechanics are what they are. You can't break physics, so they're in a good position there. <laughs> Our society, South Asia, has led the way for improving rover knowledge through the annual India Rover Challenge, which is similar to the University Rover Challenge and the European Rover Challenge that we talked about last week. Yeah, so, and I, really quickly, you know, I'm, I, um, Nora and I, we are the ones who, um, Nora is our director of chapters, and, um, uh, we start chapters all over the world, and India, the IRC, the India Rover Challenge, um, the guy who's doing that is Sagar, uh, and uh, yeah, he's doing great, he started this new chapter in South Asia, he's trying to get some more chapters all over South Asia, so we're working with, like, um, oh gosh, uh, Bhutan, um, uh, uh, even maybe even I think I'm gonna say Kazakhstan. Well, I, I was I was actually the next thing I was gonna say will will tell you. So. Oh great! Okay, good. Go for it. <laughs> no, uh, I, not to interrupt you, but uh, yeah, Mars Society India and Mars Society Bangladesh. Um, uh, in addition to those two, Mars Society South Asia is on the way to establishing chapters in surrounding countries, including Pakistan, Nepal, and Bhutan. There's more out there, but that's okay. That's a good start. Okay, we already well, that, have a Mars That's what Nora gave me. Don't blame me. Blame Nora, okay? <laughs> that's okay. No, yeah. no Nora is f fantastic. Don't. But I just want to give him, so he's actually very, being very helpful in starting out new chapters in India. Um, he's on calls for me now to help me, you know, with the, um, the gap of, of communication sometimes. And he's also concurrently working on the India Rover Challenge, another rover challenge in the world. We have Canada. Oh. We have, you know, Europe, we have Utah, and now India is starting to gain momentum. Uh, and, uh, you know, Bangladesh did a rover challenge, but India is just going to combine them together. And it's going to be huge. That is so awesome. Uh, there's so much going on uh, with our chapters nowadays. I mean, I think since Elon wrote exploding. a book, and Elon, wrote, Elon Musk wrote that book where he gave Mars Society credit for inspiring him, we have, we have wow. just exploded. How many? How many uh, organ? How many groups do you have around the world? Oh gosh, uh, say a little bit. Hundred, forty to fifty. So, I, so think. I just got back from China because um, there's uh, um, Shanghai, new chapter Shanghai and Beijing, and we also got interest to start a new chapter in Hangzhou, um, and so there's also the Mars Study China. Um, so that's China. In India, again, we used to just have Bangladesh and we had Mars Society India, and now we're growing. I've got requests for Calcutta, Chennai, um, you know, just, I mean, just all over India and now South Asia. So the introduction of our announcement of South Asia, he wants to start chapters all over South Asia, just like you said, Pakistan, Nepal, Bhutan. Um, sorry. The only then, place we're missing is Antarctica, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've got Scandinavia, we have interest in Norway, we definitely have always had Europe, um, we have Japan, we, we are, it's amazing, I, I can't keep up, I'm always on a call with some country opening up a chapter, it's amazing. Wow. Well, you, you have to right. keep up because, you know, we, <laughs> that's, we, we're, that's what we do then, we support <laughs> these chapters, so I'm not going to let you not do it. <laughs> I can't do it without yours and Nora's help. So Christopher and Nora help. Oh, I just shake and bake. You know that. <laughs> All right. So let me, let's move on though. Um, so uh, the, the point that Nora made, she's like, who would have thought 
uh, a deserted planet millions of miles from Earth would bring so many different people together. And uh, she, she is uh, definitely right about that. That's, now, nice. that's it for part one. I uh, will release part two exactly one week from the release of this video next Friday. Uh, so make sure to tune in next week as we continue with, uh, we'll, we'll talk about honorable mention news stories. And then we're going to go in depth with Scott on the Mars Underground, which he uh, directed and produced. And then uh, also his future projects, which uh, are in the works as well. And there's something exciting there, um, but I won't let you know without talking about it. It's, it's not tardigrades, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, was that? <laughs> I love it. That's episode one. Yeah, <laughs> it is. So, uh, thank you so much for watching, guys. We really appreciate your support. Um, if you would please help us, we are. You know, this is episode ten, so I say we're still kind of new. Um, like, subscribe, uh, comment, share. Um, let everybody know and uh, give us us our, your feedback. You know, what you would like to see, what you don't like to see, that kind of stuff. We take all of it good. If you want to be more involved, you can actually volunteer and help. We have uh, three or four different positions we're looking for right now. So um, people to edit, people to help find these new stories that we talk about for you. Um, uh, both James, myself, uh, let alone uh, Lucinda, you have always been busy. But us two, we're getting busier in our um, other, uh, our other endeavors in our lives. And so it's becoming harder for us to do it all. So we definitely need your help, guys. So if you are interested, let us know. Uh, also, visit MarsTalk.org uh, for all the latest episodes, social media, and links to everything else. You can follow me on Twitter at Architechnid, A-R-C-H-I-T-E-C-H-N-I-D on Twitter. And then Lucinda, um, how can people get a hold of you? Lucinda at MarsSociety.org, info at MarsSociety.org, volunteers and I can go on. <laughs> well, Lucinda at MarsSociety.org, okay? And then Scott, um, I think what you gave to me was Scott at RadiusProductions.com. That's S-C-O-T-T -T at R-A-D-I-U-S-P-R-O-D-U-C-T-I-O-N-S dot com. That's so right. um, uh, oh. if people are wanting to get in touch with Scott, that's the way to do it. Uh, this has been Mars Talk presented by the Mars Society. Scott, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate it, and I'm looking forward to talking to you next week. Um, it has been produced by Lucinda Offer, Nora Hovey, James Burke, and myself. Thanks so much for watching, guys, and we'll see you next week. Honey, do you know where my tardigrade is?